Prison is never a happy place for anybody, and we would not expect it to be a happy place. After all, it is where horrific criminals who have committed shocking crimes against humanity are sent to. But did you know that there are murderers who have committed the crime inside prison while they were serving another sentence? In this video, we will show you five such insane prisoners who murdered their own cellmates, so sit back and keep watching. Number five. We are at the Saginaw County Courthouse in Michigan for a unique sentencing hearing involving Stephen Sanderson, who is currently serving life without parole for murdering his girlfriend in 1991 in Wayne County. However, 24 years later, at the Saginaw Correctional Facility in Freeland, Sanderson committed another murder by killing his cellmate, Theodore Dyer. Dyer was serving 25 to 50 years in prison for first-degree criminal sexual conduct with a nine-year-old girl which is the most serious sexual offence involving penetration. Sanderson's attorney, James Gust, argued that the sentence was debatable under Michigan law because Sanderson had to serve his sentence for Dyer's murder consecutively to his current life sentence without parole. Hence, he had to die and come back to life before he could even begin the sentence. Number four, Shane Goldsby. Shane Goldsby is a 26-year-old man who is currently serving time in prison for stealing a police car and engaging in a wild chase that led to him crashing the vehicle and injuring an officer in 2017. As a result of this incident, he was placed in the Airway Heights Correctional Facility where he became cellmates with Robert Munger, a 70-year-old man who had been incarcerated for 43 years after being found guilty of numerous counts of child molestation and child pornography. Things took a turn for the worse when Goldsby overheard Munger boasting about his misdeeds, which included the same kind of crime that his younger sister had been a victim of years before. Goldsby was disturbed by this and slowly began to piece together who he was sharing a cell with. Despite his request for a different cellmate, Goldsby was ordered to continue sharing a cell with Munger. One day, Goldsby snapped after listening to Munger taunting him about his sister. Goldsby tried to contain his rage but could not do so in the face of constant taunting from Munger. He struck Munger from behind, knocking him to the ground and then hit and kicked him 14 times in the face and stamped on his head four more times. Munger died three days later as a result of his injuries. Despite Goldsby's difficult upbringing, he was found guilty of second-degree murder and sentenced to 25 years in prison, making his total term 33 years. He was also ordered to pay reparations to Munger's family and serve three years of parole upon completion of his sentence. Although some argue that taking another person's life is never acceptable, others argue that what Goldsby did was what any reasonable big brother would have done for their family. Number three, Anthony George. Anthony Maurice George, an inmate at Alcon Middlesex Detention Centre, was charged with taking the life of his cellmate Adam Cargus back in October 2013. Cargus, 29 years old from Sarnia, was just two weeks into his sentence for using stolen identities to buy cell phones when he was assaulted in his cell. The EMDC staff discovered his body in the jail showers around 10am the next morning. Later, an autopsy revealed that he died of blunt force trauma. Anthony, who had a violent track record, was charged with Cargus's death. He pleaded guilty to second degree in 2017 in London's courtroom. The guilty plea came nearly four years after Cargus died at the troubled London jail. This surprised Kevin Egan, the London lawyer who was representing hundreds of EMDC inmates in a class action lawsuit against the province over the poor conditions inside the jail. He said, it's somewhat anticlimactic, I guess, given we had expected to hear several weeks of testimony about the events leading to Adam's death. George grew up in Kettle Point First Nations in the woods. His parents divorced when he was 11 and his mother passed away soon after that. That began a lifetime of drinking and crimes that landed him in EMDC, where he was known as Bush Justice. Bruce Thomas said during sentencing that Adam Cargus was captive in a cage and didn't stand a chance against much bigger George. However, George's guilty plea, his troubled life and his First Nations background persuaded the judge to give him the earliest chance at parole. The judge sentenced George to life in prison with parole eligibility as early as possible under the law, so he'll have to spend at least 10 years inside to see if society will forgive him. Thomas also recommended that George receive Indigenous-based counselling in prison. George told the court that he was making alcohol on the day Adam died and that he considered Adam a friend. He said when he came to London, I told him to come down to my range and I would look after him. That night, we got locked in a cell. I asked the guards for a phone call and they told me no. I was drunk and that's what initially got me mad. And after that, I blacked out. I don't even know what happened. 
That comment caused some alarm with the judge, who then asked him twice if he intended to cause harm to Cargus. Number two, Decine Madden. Decine Madden, an inmate at Alga County, was sentenced to a minimum of 60 years and a maximum of 90 years in prison for slaying his cellmate. He was found guilty of second-degree murder and the sentence is to be served consecutively with his current term of a minimum of 16 years and a maximum of 30 years for an attack with the intent to commit slang robbery and carjacking. Madden's conviction came after a five-day trial in April during which a 12-person jury deliberated for two hours before reaching its verdict. According to officials, Madden's cellmate Rodriguez Montez Burke was found lifeless and wrapped in blankets in their cell at the Alga Correctional Facility. An autopsy report revealed that Burke's died from a closed head injury. The prosecution argued that if both inmates had been begging to move, the jail staff would have separated them. The prison staff does not intentionally make the lives of prisoners worse, as Karen Barman, the Alga County prosecuting attorney, highlighted. She said that during the trial, the jurors heard from prison officers and inmates with different viewpoints on the relationship between Burks and Madden. The officers thought that Burks felt threatened by Madden. Still, everyone agreed that it was possible to escape an undesirable cellmate. The defence argued that Madden had no intent to slay Burks and that it was a fight gone wrong. Attorney Derek Swayden said that while no one will ever know what exactly went on in that cell, much of the testimonies discussed what took place after Burks passed away and that the jury had to examine whether the incident was premeditated and deliberate. But ultimately, the jury found him guilty of second-degree murder. Number 1. Jamie Yazuna Jamie Yazuna, who was convicted of murdering a woman in Bakersfield in 2011, has been found incompetent to stand trial for the murder of his cellmate. Judge Randy Edwards of Kings County made this decision after hearing testimony from two psychiatrists, who concluded that Yazuna did not comprehend the criminal proceedings against him and could not assist his legal team in preparing a defence. Criminal proceedings have been subsequently stayed until Yazuna, who is 32 years old, is deemed competent. Yazuna is accused of decapitating and dissecting his cellmate Romero with a makeshift knife, removing an eye, a finger and a portion of the man's lung. Romero, who spent 27 years in prison, was reportedly placed in the same cell as Yazuna upon his release from Yule Creek State Prison. As a teenager, Yazuna fatally shot a woman in Compton while associating with gang members and he was convicted of second-degree murder. He was nearly eligible for parole. In the early morning hours of March 9, 2019, Yuzuna tortured and murdered Romero using a razor-style blade with a handle. Yuzuna eventually severed Romero's head. Additionally, he posed the body by slicing Romero's face open on both sides of his mouth to resemble a broad smile. Guards discovered Yuzuna wearing a necklace constructed from Romero's body parts. The reports did not specify why the officers did not discover the gruesome scene sooner. However, according to a lawsuit followed by Romero's family, the cell bars were covered with a white sheet, indicating that the guards failed to conduct a thorough inspection. If you like this video, then hit the like button, subscribe and press the bell icon to never miss another video from us.